Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to CG's seminar. Um, my name is Claire Canada. I'll be chairing today's uh, webinar. And we'll be hearing from three um, speakers, all with probably different perspectives, but um, on the issue of widening participation. So firstly, um, as the Deputy Director of CG, I'd like to welcome Peter Scott. Peter is um, Commissioner for Fair Access in Scotland and Emeritus Professor of Higher Education Studies at UCL Institute of Education. Previously, he was Vice Chancellor of Kingston University. And before that, he was the Pro Vice Chancellor um, and Professor of Education at the University of Leeds. Stephen Desjardins, um, who is a co-investigator at CG, and the two of us are working together looking at issues on student debt. Stephen is based at the University of Michigan, where he's the Marvin Peterson Collegiate Professor of Education in the School of Education, and also um, Professor of Public Policy in the Gerald Ford School of Public Policy. And finally, I'd like to introduce Pedro Texera, who is Associate Professor at the Department of Economics at the University of Porto in Portugal. And he is Director of SIPS, which is the Center of Research on Higher Education Policy. He's the former Vice Rector for Education um, at the University of Porto, and he's Special Advisor on Higher Education and Science to the President of Portugal. So all three speakers will be exploring the effects of COVID-19 on widening participation in HE. And they're going to question whether HE policies introduced primarily because of COVID and or the run of COVID, the extent to which these developments will help or hinder um, greater equality in higher education in the US and UK and Europe. Okay, Peter, over to you. And before I do that, there are a few housekeeping rules. So, firstly, um, please note that this um, webinar is being recorded and indeed details and, and the recording will be available um, later on this week um, on this website. So the next slide, this, um, here we, I just want to illustrate what we're doing in terms of, of the protocols for the meeting. Um, please keep yourself mute, muted um, unless you're going to speak or ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but please do turn it on um, when asking a question. And we recommend that you use speaker view at the top of the page um, so you can more clearly see who is talking. To ask a question, can you please use the chat function which is down at the bottom of the screen? Um, and if you type in your question, um, then um, we can field it later. And after everybody has done their presentation, if your question is selected, uh, then you'll be invited to talk to your question directly to, to whoever um, is speaking. And when you're invited um, to answer, to, to ask a question, please unmute yourself and switch on your video. Good, I'll now pass over to Peter. Uh, thank you, Claire, and uh, thank you everyone who's uh, attending virtually. Um, uh, Trevor is helping me controlling the presentation, so I hope I'll remember to ask him when we need to change slides. If you could move to the next slide, uh, please. Um, I think it's worth reminding ourselves of the current situation, which is frankly not a good place. Um, I've summarized it on this slide. Young people from the most advantaged social quintile are between three and four times more likely to participate in higher education than those from the most deprived quintile. This access gap, already pretty wide, is much greater in the case of elite universities. Uh, 
while students from more deprived backgrounds and also certainly in the UK from uh, black and ethnic minorities are concentrated in newer institutions. Um, and uh, finally, um, all governments are at least formally, I think, committed to widening participation um, and some progress has been made. I say some um, because working in this field as Commissioner for Fair Access in Scotland, um, where I think actually pretty substantial progress has been made, I'm very aware of the kind of the obstacles which are kind of social uh, cultural but also academic they, they derive from some of our assumptions about uh, who's fit to take part in higher education if i could just have the next slide please um i think it's worth reminding us why does this matter um, um there's first of all an economic case i call it an efficiency case for wider participation uh, we need to maximize our skills base we need to enhance employability and we to realize the full potential of workers in our economy, not just those who happen to be born from socially privileged families. But also there's a very strong uh, social and political case, a fairness case, um, which for me weighs much more. Uh, and it's about empowering citizens. It's about democratic entitlement. If we take democracy seriously, I think we have to think in terms of uh, leveling the playing field and access to higher education. Um, it's about all the social benefits that arrive from higher education, which should be widely distributed. And frankly, in an age of populism, rising populism and increasing uh, political tensions in the world, um, it's a key element, I think, in promoting inclusivity. Um, next slide, please. Um, the implications of COVID. Well, here we have the problem. Uh, and uh, I'm sure all of you remember Donald Rumsfeld's uh, knowns known unknowns and unknown unknowns he wasn't actually the originator of that and it's not such a stupid remark as it was often uh, said to be um because frankly we know very little about the consequences uh, we've had a mountain of speculation and for example are we going to see a kind of accelerated and irreversible shift towards blended learning um perhaps with the emphasis on online learning or are we going to see a kind of new divide developing between those who actually uh, benefit from on-campus residential education uh, uh, and those who in a sense are um, uh, relegated to accessing higher education online um, and it doesn't take much imagination to imagine which social groups uh, will benefit from that if there is such a divide there's a lot of speculation about what's going to happen to international education after all for the last two decades and what we've been used to the fact that number of international students will go on exponentially increasing um, but maybe it won't in the future um, not simply because of covid uh, but perhaps more radically because of changing attitudes to climate change are we going to see a shift towards vocational professional education or are we going to see a reinforcement of elite universities um, or are we going to see a sudden death of mass higher education we lose faith in it, the whole project um, uh, or will in practice we will see an acceleration of student demand simply because of a weak labour market? And finally, are we on the brink of a radical restructuring of higher education systems? Or frankly, will normal service, or as normal as it can be, resumed uh, as soon as possible? Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to talk about four main things in relation to widening participation. Um, First of all, the narrowing of the student experience with a shift to online education and also limited access to campus. Secondly, digital poverty, um, which we talked about a lot, um, but also I think linked to that spatial poverty, um, which particularly affects disadvantaged students. Um, are we going to see an erosion of a kind of regime of what is often called textual admissions, making more limited off uh, lower offers to those who have a, had a poor um uh, uh inadequate educational experience before higher education uh, or are we going to see a, a kind of reinforce of very simplified standardized school uh, uh examinations and higher education entrance requirements what i call baked in inequality um uh, and are we finally going to see a, a, a reduction in the number of part-time jobs um to fund study in university uh, during the course but also a shrinking or a radical change of the graduate labor market subsequently. <clears throat> so next slide, please. Um, 
to talk first about the student experience. Um, all universities in recent years have had invested an awful lot in improving the quote student experience. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. Um, uh, the proliferation of more formal satisfaction surveys, um, competition between institutions and so on. And also because we want to do the right thing by our students. Um, um, uh, and we've all stressed the experience outside the classroom or the lecture hall. I mean, politics, clubs, sport, all those things, um, giving a rounded university experience. Um, and also attendance on campus helps to build cultural capital, particularly perhaps for those that um, uh, bring less cultural capital and social capital in the first place. And also a key to establishing social networks which relate to future employment, um, but perhaps the whole enjoyment of our future lifestyle. And I think we've you've been used to the idea of seeing the campus experience as a social leveler. I mean, of course, it's a divider because, I mean, people belong to different clubs or fraternities or whatever, and we could see a lot of that on campus. But it is, on the whole, I think, a leveler. And next slide, please. Um, this is just a view from Harvard. I'm sorry, Stephen, I'm, I'm taking a, an American example when I uh, should take a UK example. It would be easy to find a UK example, but I just noticed this recently. This is a quote uh, from the New York Times, uh, whether it's from a sophomore student um, at Harvard. Um, and that I think expresses it very well, that it's an equalizer. And if you take that away, um, you are going to increase inequality. Um, next slide, please. Uh, digital poverty. We talk a lot about digital poverty um, uh, and we're all aware of the unequal distribution of IT kit and we know who's going to have the better kit. Um, not everyone will have a top of the range MacBook. Um, some people have to make do with very basic uh, computers and so on. Then there's the issue of connectivity in the home, um, which we're talking about uh, online learning is crucial and the competition from that. I mean, uh, there might be other people who want to be online at the same time. Uh, for example, uh, doing their work remotely or simply playing games or entertainment. I mean, um, and again, uh, I think the more deprived a family, the more likely you are to see competition for that. And finally, quite simply housing, and what I call spatial poverty earlier, um, uh, that I think if you come from a middle class background, it's, it's sort of natural to assume there will be some place you can go um, maybe not actually a formal study, but a kind of semi-dedicated study space where you can work. Um, frankly, that doesn't apply to lots of people's homes. Uh, they live a very different kind of lifestyle. Um, so all those things, I think, discriminate quite strongly against people from a more socially deprived background. Next slide, please. What I call baked in inequality. And we're all aware of the kind of attainment and aspiration gap in secondary education. Um, and that's something which people working in the field of writing participation and fair access have to kind of grapple with all the time. Um, um, uh, but some of the measures that have been taken, particularly, for example, the temporary, let's hope, uh, but perhaps intermittent actual physical closure of schools, um, as well as uh, uh, change attitudes to school examinations, um, which are the key to university entrance. Um, that's really going to have a big impact. Um, and it may be that, as I said at the start, the whole idea of contextual admissions of actually trying to customize the kind of uh, require, entry requirements you, uh, you, you, you have to the actual social background and prior education experience of students, um, that could be under threat. And frankly, the, the idea of kind of more simplified and more standardized testing in schools, um, some countries are much more used to that than others, um, um, I think is potentially also a threat. Um, people say it's great. I mean, grades perhaps are going to be fixed by, by teachers in future, uh, but of course they're going to be moderated to see how those schools, secondary schools have performed in the past. And that's why I call it baked inequality, because whatever's happened in the past will continue to the future. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then finally, jobs and employment. Um, well, I think it's pretty clear there's going to be a significant reduction in part-time jobs, um, both on campus uh, and in the wider economy. Um, the kind of jobs the students have traditionally done to work their way through college. Um, uh, and 
I think it's pretty apparent that the kind of students who need that kind of paid employment more are those who come from more socially deprived and inevitably financially deprived backgrounds. Um, now it's fine, as I say, for kind of students probably attending elite universities who come from more prosperous families. They can rely more on what sometimes tradition called the bank of mum and dad. Um, but if you're coming from a different kind of background and you don't have those financial resources, you're going to face a very different situation. Um, um, uh, now, I think many governments uh, are aware of the need to produce some kind of financial substitute in terms of grants and loans for that lost income that students might have had, earned income might have had. But I think it's going to be really hard to match what's happened with that. And then finally, thinking a bit more long term, I mean, I think we're all going to face for a long time quite a, a depressed and certainly a very greatly changed graduate job market. Um, and in a job market in which there's more competition, um, I think experience teaches us that those who actually have access to large amounts of cultural capital, who have access to privileged social networks, which can be expressed through unpaid internships and so on. They are the people who have the competitive advantage in that kind of labor market. So my final slide, please. Can it still be done? Um, well, from what I've said, you might think I'm a bit pessimistic about that. Um, and certainly none of the kind of temporary emergency measures that have been associated with the COVID pandemic are really at all helpful in terms of widening participation to higher education for the reasons I've given. But I do believe it still can be done. Um, it can be done basically if governments around the world recommit themselves to the goal of widening access to higher education for all those kind of economic efficiency and social or fairness reasons which I, I, I outlined earlier. Um, uh, because if we don't do that, I think we are going to run the risk of rolling back mass access. And obviously there are some right-wing governments, some not too far from where I am at the moment, um, who would probably welcome that. Um, and that their commitment to fair access has always been rather paper thin. I think we would also require system-wide action. Uh, I think intermediary bodies of various kinds um, do need to actually take action here. We can't simply rely on the goodwill of individual universities, however important it is to respect university autonomy. There has to be action, decisive action at that level, intervention. And finally, um, I think we have to see some strategic rededication, I call it, by individual universities themselves. I mean, they have to actually really believe in this and really put major efforts behind it. Um, uh, and finally, uh, and perhaps here I'm betraying my political inclinations a bit too much, um, but I do think that you can only do this by reviving the kind of idea of the public domain and, and strengthening the idea of how education is a public good and linking it to what I said earlier, which is the fact that we live in democracies. Um, that's a kind of aspect which never receives as much emphasis as it should have. Um, and we need to dedicate ourselves to greater equality Social mobility is always a bit of a cop-out because everyone believes in upward social mobility, although not that much of it happens if you look at the data, but no one believes in downward social mobility. And we all know that privileged social groups will resist very strongly and generally successfully any form of downward mobility. So social mobility is a kind of limited goal, I think. We need to actually go beyond that and think in terms of social equality. Or maybe it will all go wrong, and maybe, in a sense, some of the trends which have been apparent in higher education, the marketization of higher education, a commodification of, of a university education as a private good, um, uh, that those will um, reassert themselves. And the one worry I have is that um, I think in many countries, uh, faced with a COVID emergency, universities are not actually going to be at the top of government's list in terms of public investment. So I, I'm moderately optimistic, but it will require quite an effort of will on the part of all levels, individuals, institutions, um, and governments. Thank you. That's great. That's a fantastic overview, um, Peter. And I'm so glad that you didn't just rely or focus exclusively on access because winding participation means so much more. It's not just only getting in, 
but it's also one's experience while at university and then what happens on graduation. So thank you. Can we now move straight on to Stephen um, from, from the US? Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Peter. Sure. <clears throat> thanks, Claire, and thanks for inviting me to be part of this webinar sponsored by CG. It's been a pleasure to be part of the team of researchers working on a number of interesting higher education related projects administered by CG over the last couple of years. Today, uh, I'd like to provide some background of what's transpiring in the U.S. in terms of post-secondary education enrollment management issues with a special focus on what's thought to be the case for the academic year coming up for 2021. Um, this is a more micro kind of level analysis than what Peter just did, but um, uh, it's, it's kind of the most timely information we have about what we think is going to happen for this coming fall. Uh, first, some context may be helpful. Uh, compared to other higher education systems, the United States system is really largely independent from the national government regulation and it's highly decentralized. So it's incredible, and it's an incredibly diverse uh, system where there's public and private institutions, technical, vocational, two and four year degree granting institutions, research and teaching institutions, really large uh, institutions in very small liberal arts colleges, secular and religiously affiliated, locational differences by urban, suburban and rural, and, this complexity makes it really difficult to generalize about the effects of shocks to the system, such as the Great Recession in 2008 and the current COVID uh, situation. How such shock plays out will vary <clears throat> across this entire structure of post-secondary education. And in addition, in some ways we are dealing with both types of shocks, the recession uh, you know, the contraction induced in the economy due to COVID. So it's really kind of multiply complicated, thus making any kinds of predictions about what will transpire in the fall and throughout the next academic year and even beyond are challenging to say the least. Um, noting those caveats, enrollment declines have been one of the biggest concerns of college and university professors. According to a survey conducted in mid-April, 90% of those surveyed, and there was a couple hundred institutions surveyed, both two and four year institutions, the presidents expressed uh, their concerns about the potential enrollment declines in regard to COVID, and they were particularly worried about its inequitable impact on underrepresented students. In the latest iteration of that survey published just uh, a couple weeks ago, the, uh, the concerns remain significant with 50% saying they were still very or somewhat concerned about future enrollments and 90% of them still expressing concerns regarding the unequitable uh, impact of the virus. These worries aren't groundless and based on multiple other surveys conducted in March and April, some were predicting four-year colleges may face a loss of up to 20% in fall enrollments. For example, the American College and Education was projecting that on-campus college enrollment would fall by 15% in the next academic year, including a projected decline of 20, 25% for international students. And this would induce revenue losses of some $23 billion in the system. Whether these will come true is yet to be determined, of course, but we won't really know till September and beyond and I could talk a little bit about the project we're ramping up to try to figure that out later on if need be, but um, recent evidence, more recent evidence provides a more mixed picture of the impacts and how they're likely to differ across institutional types. According to one report, college enrollments are going to expected to be down about between five and 20%, depending on the types of institutions, their location. These, uh, Institutions are reliant, uh, you know, a lot of like private colleges may be particularly hard hit, private liberal, liberal arts colleges, because they're really highly reliant on tuition and student fees compared to the public counterparts and the enrolled large shares of out of state students who pay in our system on average about 2.5 times what an in student, state student would pay at a public institution. And there's demographic 
uh, differences too, like private colleges in really competitive areas like in the Northeast where there's hundreds, literally hundreds of institutions um, will be suspect, uh, you know, uh, susceptible to the demand profiles that they have. And um, they'd be particular, there's already institutions that were struggling prior to COVID. And there's a lot of, and some have already closed and there's indications that others will too. Um, you know, those with a wider geographic draw or higher selectivity profiles and with strong, strong admissions pools are likely to be, and diversity and revenue sources are gonna be less vulnerable. And um, public institute research institutions like the one I work at, the University of Michigan, the trends seem to be stable in terms of enrollments, with many of them reporting having met their fall enrollment targets based on projections from students who have committed to enroll or paid enrollment or housing deposits. So we see these precursors that we can use. Um, two think tanks have developed an impact model of COVID-19 to try to estimate the potential impacts of COVID on enrollments and funding levels and found that broad access institutions and comprehensive four-year sector may be the most vulnerable to enroll enrollment impacts in part because they're heavily reliant on state appropriations which are, which are likely to be cut. And these, this is where a lot of there and in also in community colleges where a lot of underrepresented students go to school. And so uh, these, this group always also said they see a significant reshuffling of enrollment among resident and non-resident students that are likely to have a big impact. So, um, and, and we see this in other reports too, where students are, uh, that would normally go out of state to school are looking more towards uh, institutions that are nearby. And um, so there's gonna be this distributional effect of the non-resident resident student population. And it might just then therefore be a shifting of the chairs that there's not really a real large declines, but people are just choosing different places to go. Um, but, uh, but institutions that lose non-resident enrollments, you know, have to pick up two or three new in-state students in order to, to meet their rep, to, to get the same revenue. So it has real financial implications. Um, in regard to the effect on different subgroups, the pandemic's likely to, of course, disproportionately affect the enrollments of low-income and underrepresented students who are been traditionally most vulnerable, even in the best of times. One, um, that survey of presidents, 75% of the presidents uh, said they were very concerned about needy students. And uh, in particular at community colleges, um, one provost noted it will be critical for institutions to proactively reach out to these individuals and provide, provide them with support services financial counseling, academic counseling, emotional counseling, help them navigate their options. And um, one way we've tried to figure out what the effects of, of the crisis will be on enrollments is by monitoring the app for, for underrepresented students, in particular low income students, is by monitoring the, the federal aid application. Um, this cycle, this is called FAFSA, the application. And it's a very, the aid, aid, uh, aid applications are very strong indicators of post-secondary enrollments. So over the last number of months, a bunch of people have been uh, monitoring these week by week. And we can look at these over year over year percentages. And um, through the end of June, when the process just ended, the data indicated that there were about 2 million completions compared to about 2.1 last year. Uh, it was a decline at, in actual numbers of about 81,000 students um, on a class of about three and a half million high school graduates, uh, which is a 40,000 student decrease over 2019. Thus, uh, it, it looks like the, uh, the app rate for FAFSA is pretty stable across the last three years. It declined a little bit recently, but it should be noted that some of the declines of FAFSA completion are are due to smaller high school graduating classes, but certainly COVID too. And we could see this in the month to month comparisons. Um, you know, 
in April, we were seeing uh, four, a projected 4% or actual 4% drops in overall applications and double digit declines among low income and, and minority students. These have rebounded in recent months, and, um, but they're still, they, the rebound has been not as fast for students from the lowest income groups, those under 25,000 US dollars compared to those with higher incomes and among Pell eligible students, those that grant for needy students, is it didn't rebound nearly as, <clears throat> nearly as fast for non-Pell eligible students. Another way to examine the effects of the FAFSA completion are on looking at the characteristics of the high schools the students attended as a proxy for um, <clears throat> you know, low income and other fa um, at risk factors. And it turns out, Public high schools with higher concentrations of students from low income backrooms have FAFSA completion declines twice those of their more affluent peers. And there's a clear um, difference across suburban and urban and, and rural areas with the rural and, and small town areas having much steeper declines in these applications. So there's geographic differences going on here too. <clears throat> um, Notwithstanding, I, I think there's some hope here because we were seeing what, what in, in March people were really concerned and it looked like it was going to be really bad. And so the rebounds are, are a good indication. And of course, we won't know until September. Um, in other data, we can see declines, you know, across the racial and ethnic divide and across um, the institution types. Again, there's this in-state, out-of-state difference in community college versus four-year probably movement. Um, but all these moving parts create real challenges for leaders to try to figure out what's going on in terms of enrollment management for institutions and, and the effects it's gonna have, not just in the short run, but longer term. A few policy things that I'd like to bring up that are happening here that were important is, is like, one is really interesting that in kind of maybe U.S. perspective is like who's really going to determine whether or not institutions have in-person or, or, or not uh, instruction. The federal government has virtually no authority to, to tell institutions what to do about this. The states have, you know, almost all of them have different kinds of governance structures. And so you have this great deal of uh, heterogeneity in terms of who can deal with this. And that's a really interesting problem. You know, California is gonna do one thing. Michigan has institutions of constitutional autonomy. No one can tell the University of Michigan what they need to do, not legally. And so it's very different than it is elsewhere. And the same with the health agencies. What's gonna happen, you know, state, the state governors right now have emergency powers, but it's being challenged in the court. So can they tell institutions what they're going to have to do. Uh, then, of course, you probably all heard about the student visa issues, which was, a, you know, a Homeland Security was going to prohibit international students from being in the states unless if they were going to take online only classes. They've rescinded that order as of two days ago. I think that, uh, you know, the institutions came together and filed lawsuits and they were uh, successful in getting the federal government to back off of this ruling. And so there's a, and then there's the whole admissions test kind of, uh, you know, the testing agencies backed off on the, on the admissions test. And so some institutions then are not, we're not requiring for the next cycle or even the cycle after these tests. And many wonder what's going to happen in terms of the test optional movement or even test blind admissions policies that that states or institutions take up. So there's a whole lot of uncertainty here and there's a lot of things we could cover in the time allotted, but I look forward to a discussion and I'm happy to elaborate on any of these issues. Thank you. Stephen, thank you. Um, that, that's, that's great. Um, can we now move and see what ha what's happening in the rest of Europe? Uh, or the real Europe. Um, <laughs> Pedro, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. And uh, thank you to, she, uh, to the Centre for the invitation. And I mean, um, there are always advantages in this event. As an economist, you always talk about costs and benefits. So to be the last one speaking means that I can uh, save some time in certain things. It means also that I need to 
um, maybe think how that how I can contribute to the discussion. And I mean, I agree with a lot of things that have been said, and and therefore I will try to focus on uh, one of the aspects that has been um, maybe less visible in the discussion so far, which is, I mean, we, when we talk about equity, um, we talk um, about very often the overall level of participation, which has been a center issue and which groups tend to participate more. Um, but I think increasingly in higher education, one of the areas of concern has been not only how many students go to uh, enroll in higher education, but where do the students go? to which type of institutions, um, in which fields, because we also know that this tends to have consequences in terms of their lifetime prospects. So we know that rates of return are different according to types of institutions, according to um, uh, different fields and disciplines. And, and one of the areas that I'm particularly concerned about the current uh, pandemic and the impact that is having on the educational system is to what extent this will, um, by accelerating or by strengthening certain trends, will exacerbate inequalities regarding that, that dimension. So I think there is an area of concern uh, across Europe and in certainly many systems about how much the crisis, the health crisis, but also the, 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 the economic and social crisis will affect the levels of participation. But um, this will affect in an uneven way, different groups. And, and I think there are some changes that are being introduced at the moment uh, on a temporary basis that I think will affect, um, or that may have a detrimental impact in terms of equity. Um, just briefly, uh, because we don't have much time. I mean, when we look at the, 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 the pattern in terms of access systems in Europe, what we do tend to find is uh, a lot of that is dominated by um, what actually, uh, what is the assessment of secondary education. So most of the exams that students do are exams that are very much aligned with secondary education. They are organized very often by the, the, the let's say, the, the, the non higher education part. And most of higher education institutions tend to take this as a, as a sort of proxy for the students' abilities, for their academic performance. Um, and, um, and regardless if you have a sort of an open system or selective system, if you have a more centralized system of application or more decentralized, um, the examinations in secondary education tend to play a central role in terms of um, um, discriminating the students and, 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 their, and their possibilities and their, 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 how wide are their choices. Um, regarding progression of, uh, of studies, but mainly, especially access to more competitive institutions and to more competitive programs. Um, what we have seen, um, in, and this goes sort of before the pandemic, uh, in several European systems, there is some uneasiness on the side of secondary education about this, because they think basically the, the, the mission of secondary education is to prepare students for higher education. We, we that are focused on higher education don't tend to be, because we are academics, we don't tend to talk much to secondary school teachers, but there is, in many systems, there's not much relationship between the two parts. There's certainly very little discussion between the, the two groups. And, um, but my impression is that in many systems, um, secondary school teachers, um, headmasters, headmistress, resent the fact that their mission in many ways is to just to prepare the students for the exams and to education. And that narrows the, the meaning of their role as educators, and that also um, narrows their sort of their view about what education is about. Um, and with the pandemic, um, several countries suspended these examinations because they thought it was uh, not feasible. Others have reduced the role and the importance that these exams were supposed to to play, in some cases, the number of exams that the students had to, were uh, obliged to, uh, to perform was also reduced, and, and therefore they will, they will tend to play a smaller role. And in some ways, this is also being discussed in several European systems as an opportunity to rethink uh, systems of access to higher education and think, well, since we, we can do this this year, why not taking this as an opportunity to rethink 
and to play down the role of national exams and standardized instruments? And why not uh, broaden the, the criteria that higher education institutions use to uh, select students and to a large extent to transfer that responsibility to the side of higher education? So higher education institutions should shouldn't be so lazy, they should take more care of that responsibility. After all, they should know better what are the type of profiles that they want to select that fit uh, better the, 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 what they want. And, and we have had some evidence that in some cases, um, secondary uh, school exams are not necessarily the best predictors uh, regarding what's the, the subsequent performance of students in higher education. So, there is some, some divergence there. Um, and, 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 in, and to a large extent, I think this also fits into a sort of broader trend in higher education in Europe towards you know, greater differentiation, uh, greater decentralization, more institutional autonomy, more competition that was already mentioned. So to a certain extent that would fit the, the environment that we've been facing in higher education in many countries, which have made let's say, and I'm, I'm simplifying a lot, of course, um, continental European systems closer to what was happening in Anglo-Saxon countries. Um, why uh, do I have concerns about this? It's because I think the more we, um, we know, we have evidence of, for several countries that standardizing testing tends to be more objective and tends to um, reduce the bias that quite often we find in secondary school um, examinations and also in secondary school grades. Uh, for various reasons, because we know that uh, parents with um, more resources, and, and by more resources, I mean not only financial resources, but cultural resources, will be better equipped to choose which institutions, uh, which schools are better and can prepare their children better to, in terms of secondary education, in terms of subsequent education. Um, the resources that those schools either the best public schools or, um, and public schools, I mean state schools, sorry, um, uh, and uh, private uh, schools have, um, in many cases, are very different and, and they're much better equipped than, than many other state schools, especially more deprived uh, regions. And, and therefore, um, you know, the, the, the more what we know is that uh, the standardizing testing tends to reduce that kind of bias. Um, and the more we broaden the criteria, um, then the question is, who is responsible for this? Whereas in the systems that are more regulated, where the schools need to prepare the older students for the same exams, to a large extent, the schools know either explicitly or implicitly that they will be assessed in terms of the performance of their students. So it's, it's, it's central to the responsibility of all schools that their students have a good performance. If we broaden this to other criteria, in some cases that will introduce greater subjectivity, I fear that in many cases, a lot of the responsibility for the performance of students will be transferred also for the, for the students and the families. And I think we know what to expect in that situation. So that the families with more resources, again, pecuniary, but also non-pecuniary resources will know better how to prepare their children for that kind of criteria. We have, I mean, we could use the kind of example, um, for instance, uh, of Oxbridge, where the criteria are much more diverse. And, and we know how difficult it is for someone from a less privileged uh, background to be um, capable of competing with those that come from more privileged backgrounds, either from the public sector or from the private sector. So um, one of my main concern is that by decentralizing and by differentiating this and through the opportunity that the pandemic is creating um, that increasingly will have a system where the opportunities for social reproduction, uh, reproduction of inequalities uh, namely regarding which institutions which fields to attend um, how the, the, those choices are suitable for the, the interest, the motivation, the profile of those students will tend to be increasingly amplified in terms of inequalities. And, um, and I think one of the um, 
concerns that I have is to what extent these temporary situations that is opened by the pandemic will be um, used by some different stakeholders in the system that for a long time may be interested. Uh, and I have to say that in many cases, um, out of goodwill, I think some of these people really believe that um, having different systems of, of uh, assessing students and, and in term, and changing the, the system of access uh, to higher education um, could be, from an educational point of view, more effective. But my uh, major concern is that they will have the perverse effect of uh, exacerbating inequalities because some students and some families will be better qualified to navigate through a much more complex and a much more diverse system. So I think um, from, let's say, from the topic that we were discussing today or that we are discussing today, you know, I'm, I'm very much concerned as someone like all of us that are interested in issues of access and equity. I think we will have the experiment in front of us uh, during the coming months and we can discuss to what extent um, the changes that are being introduced in some European systems and I know that I think in some state systems in the US, this is also taking place. Uh, to what extent this will confirm our concerns about uh, changes in the system, or to what extent that this creates opportunities for greater differentiation of the system in a way that just not, does not reproduce inequalities. And I think I should stop there so that we can have some time for discussion. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much, uh, Pedro. That, that was splendid. So um, I'm going to start off with what various questions um, in, the, in the chat room. And let's start off with Zachary Swan. This is a question to Peter Scott. Zachary, do you want to come on? Show yourself. Uh, yeah, good morning. Colleagues, uh, first, thank you so much for the presentation um, uh, and for the opportunity to ask my question. Um, my question, I think, derives from Professor Scott's discussion about uh, the access to the facilities of institutions as having a social justice element, uh, if you will, uh, your point about uh, spatial poverty. And I think this is really interesting, especially as you raise it in relief of the issue of residence and distance learning modes of education. And I think my question for you is if you wouldn't mind just maybe uh, expanding on that point a bit about some of the issues either you've seen from the literature research or your own experience on how access to the built environments or estates of universities um, influences uh, sort of issues of equity, uh, especially when we think about how students Gener we expect students uh, to generate a sense of personal or social capital, if you will, uh, as, a, as a part of participating in those places. Thank you. Uh, Peter, you need to unmute yourself. Right. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me, hear me now? Good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, I mean, I think the essential point I was trying to make was that the actual experience on campus is potentially quite a leveler, and it's more important for people who bring least social capital to, uh, to the party, so to speak. Um, if you come from a family, for example, where your parents themselves have been university graduates, uh, you've been very used, you have a, a strong idea of what being at university is like, and you can benefit from that. Um, someone coming <clears throat> from a very unfamiliar background they have a lot to learn from their campus experience. And if they're denied the campus experience, they're denied that learning opportunity. I mean, that was essentially the point I was trying to make. Um, of course, I accept our inequalities even on campus, um, but essentially it puts students more on a level playing field uh, than if they're studying remotely. Um, that's not an argument against well-designed distance learning systems. I mean, obviously like the Open University in the UK and similar initiatives in other countries, these have made a massive contribution to, to, to widening participation um, in higher education. Um, but I do think the very fact we've stressed so strongly in recent years, the student experience and try and invested a lot of money, typically in most campuses in enhancing the student facilities, um, demonstrates how important that is. And that was really the point I was trying to make. Thank you. Um, Simon Martinson, um, I think you've got a, a question for Pedro. 
Yes, thanks, Claire. Um, thank you for all to all three speakers for very interesting um, presentations and nice to see you. And um, thanks, Claire, too, for the for this webinar. Um, Pedro, uh, I know it's early days in the pandemic. Um, you know, in terms of consolidated information, I mean, we, we don't have a clear picture of many things yet. And some trends, of course, are just beginning to take shape. But what I want to ask you about is what I think is the big one for us, and that's the financial sustainability of the sector in the medium to long term. Um, and, I, and, and I'm asking you this because I, I know that you, you hear things, you pick up the vibes from different countries. And, um, it's in that context that, that I'm addressing this to you. What I want to ask you about is the high performance, high funding, high participation, high science systems in Western Europe. You know, the strong examples. Um, Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, Austria, Germany, the Scandinavian countries and so on. Um, what are you hearing about the position in those kind of strong systems? Enrolments, are they going to be sustained in the beginning of the next academic year? what's happening with online learning, what's happening with research funding, what, what are the policy makers saying about higher education when they've got much bigger things to worry about right now? I mean, I ask you this because I think if the, a number of those systems are in trouble, these high performance, high participation, high science systems, then the sector as a whole is in dire trouble worldwide. Mm. As I, thank you, Simon. Um, as I said, I, as you said, I think it's 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 still difficult to know because I mean you can get some indications, but I think uh, because of uh, in many cases applications are directed to institutions. I think we we have difficult to to get a sort of a clear picture. And but what we've seen, um, I think there are two indications that um, one of the concerns in terms of. The European landscape is that inequalities will tend to increase. Uh, we have seen this uh, in the aftermath of the Great Recession. So when we look at the data in terms of the evolution of funding, countries that were big, uh, that, have, that had a strong engagement in terms of funding of public higher education and science have sustained this uh, in the last decade, in some cases reinforced this. And the countries that normally at lower levels of uh, funding and, and especially funding for students have actually reduced further uh, this. So we have amplified um, inequalities and, and the impact of the crisis as we've seen uh, the current health crisis also hasn't been as symmetric as people have been saying in the beginning. I mean, some countries have been more effective and especially the economic and social impact of, of the crisis also will be diverse across Europe. All the countries will suffer, but we, we are already getting the sense that some countries will suffer more than others. And some of the countries that will suffer more are countries that are already, uh, whose public finances are already in a situation that makes it even more difficult for those high education systems to be sustained. I mean, I'm talking of countries like Spain, Italy, Greece, Portugal, countries that will tend to suffer more also because of the way, for instance, uh, the crisis affecting tourism um, and uh, all the constellation of sectors that go around this. Um, and that to a certain extent, we're expecting to some of the recovery. I think a lot of that will depend what will be the response in terms of Europe. Um, I know that to, to, to express confidence in Europe, <laughs> In, in this context, I'm not so sure it's, it's, sort of, it's the, the wisest thing, but uh, after all the, that we have seen in recent years. Um, but I think there's still there an opportunity. And I think if there is some kind of European response, um, I think that there is a chance to keep at least uh, a minimum in terms of some of the systems. Otherwise, my expectation will be that you will have a reinforcement of inequalities across Europe in terms of certainly not only internally that I, I spoke about before, but uh, between countries. And I would expect that some of those systems will benefit more or that it will be able to cope better with the, the crisis than some of the weakest ones. Thank you.
Great. So the next um, person, um, so Trish Victorita, would you like to ask your question? Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Claire, for this interesting uh, webinar. Thank you, too, uh, for the speakers from today. I am Victorita Triff from the University of Bucharest, and uh, I want to ask, what are the most important dilemmas of contemporary higher education from the United States of America? Thank you very much. Okay, so that's a rather a big one. Um, so, so, Stephen, are you around to answer that? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe try and uh, just, just no, limit I, it. I think, honestly, in the short run, what we're talking about is the survival of some institutions. Is that there were already given, given um, uh, kind of um, the, the structure in some uh, different uh, parts of the uh, system in the United States, quite a few institutions who were teetering, some have already uh, closed. And so a shock like this to the system could put some of these, and it already has, put some of these institutions out of business. And so some of them are, ta are literally talking about their survival. Um, another thing you might see is like consolidations. Um, and that's one way that some institutions have survived is they've consolidated with other institutions. And so we've seen more consolidation in, in recent years. And so in the short run, I think that's the case. I think that uh, in the longer run, it's still uh, an issue that's been with us for a long time and, and will continue to be in my view access and success of students. The system, when you look at access and or success, is highly stratified. Um, there are some sectors that do really well in terms of bringing in um, students who are historically underrepresented. Um, sometimes they're not served very well in terms of their outcomes. And then there's other institutions that are, uh, you know, uh, that do real well, but they might not bring in as many uh, uh, students who haven't been served well. And so it's still for us to try to figure out how to balance access and uh, success across a really complicated kind of <laughs> system of higher education. And so I think that's an ongoing problem for us as um, researchers, but also for the policymakers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do Peter, Pedro and Stephen, do you, is there anything else you'd like to say um, just very, very quickly to wrap things up? We've literally got, uh, you've got a minute each. <laughs> Peter. Um, no, I'm fine. I mean, uh, I, I think the only point, I'm just perhaps picking up about Simon's question, um, which institutions or which kind of institutions are gonna be most stressed by this? would depend an awful lot on, on, on where enrollments hold up and where they, where they falter. Um, I think there was a fear here in the UK earlier in the summer that home students would be less willing to go to university next, year, next, next autumn. And that looks to have disappeared. I mean, mainly, probably not because they actually are keen to go to university under these circumstances, but simply because the kind of, uh, the, the, the alternatives to in a very depressed job market are so poor. Um, uh, but there's still the threat of international students uh, not turning up. And of course, recent geopolitical events and political tensions um, are going to contribute to that because, of course, China is a major supplier, source of international students to nearly every country. Um, so it's difficult to predict. I mean, if, it's, if the hedge is on international students, one kind of institution will suffer. If the hedge is on, on home demand, domestic demand, it will be other institutions. So it's really very difficult to play this out. Pedro, is there anything you'd like to add? I mean, I have just an additional comment related to what um, Peter just said. I think in some ways it's ironic that the systems that are, are more um, self-centered and have been so much internationalized will tend to be more protected. Uh, I mean, and the institutions that are more um, embedded in terms of their regional market uh, I think in some ways will be more insulated from some of the crises. 
Um, the other thing for me is to what, what will be the position of some governments. I mean, we've we come from several years where government, several governments in Europe had been willing to differentiate, to go along what uh, Steve was talking about in the US, I mean, to really differentiate the system by promoting more some institutions, either because of rankings, because of more resources, various reasons. And so I wonder if I mean, the, the, the current crisis also strengthened the role of the state. And, and, and we've seen these discussions emerging in business sectors and industrial policy again. So I wonder how much of these will also be channeled into higher education that the governments will be willing to protect some institutions and, and my gut feeling would be that they will tend to protect the more prestigious ones. Um, Great, thank you. And Stephen, any other final comments? Um, this, this arose in some conversations we were having as you know, we're a graduate faculty of the higher ed program. And I think that it's more general though, uh, and it's not being discussed very much is who gets to determine the pedagogical issues such as mode of delivery. And, you know, historically, and this, again, is differentiated very much across institution types in this country. You have a lot of adjuncts teaching at community colleges. They don't have much power. They get told what to do at places like I work at, where you have tenured professors like me and, and others, is we have a lot of autonomy in terms of what we, get to, what we can teach. But all of a sudden, you have uh, administrations and even states, in our case, sometimes saying, you're going to online and, you know, the, and, and, the, and so there's an issue about faculty autonomy pushing up against kind of the rules that are being put in place. And so, you know, I think that's something that uh, hasn't been on the radar screen, but it's really important in terms of um, uh, it, 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 it's different across institution types and it's different even within institutions. So. Uh, you know, um, that, that's, that's something that uh, is a concern to me. Great. Well, can I think, thank all three of you for great contributions, different perspectives, no overlap, um, and fascinating issues that you've all raised. Well, thank you so much indeed. Um, so there's another seminar next week um, on Tuesday, the uh, 21st of July, and that's a panel looking at the global geopolitics of science. Now we'll leave the chat function open for um, a few minutes afterwards. So if any of the participants want to continue talking to each other, please go ahead. Um, and uh, well, we'll then close it down after that. So uh, to the speakers, thank you very much indeed. That's great. And, um, and, and I hope to see you again in, in person sometime very soon. Okay, take care.